The event horizon of a black hole seems to be a really mysterious place. Why is it so fascinating for physicists? That's an excellent question. So event horizon uh, of a black hole is this very mysterious place in a space and time which separates two very, very different fates for uh, observers or people who happen to come across it. So the people or observers who are inside the event horizon, they, uh, they are guaranteed according to Einstein's theory of relativity to be crushed uh, by, uh, by a singularity. Um, so a horrible death, uh, but the people who happen to be outside of it, they have a chance of escaping to, and, and enjoy their lives as they wish without uh, having to worry about uh, singularities. So that's, uh, that's a very dramatic difference. Um, there, is, there are very few guarantees in life, but Einstein's theory of relativity gives you this guarantee that if you cross this, this place, uh, then there is only one possible end basically to your existence. And the, the, the most bizarre thing about it is that you never actually notice that uh, you cross this boundary. So there's an invisible boundary that when you cross it, you don't notice. But if you do cross it, then your fate is going to be dramatically different as opposed to if you didn't cross it. We all know there's something strange about the black hole evaporation that leads to the information paradox. How is this related to quantum tunneling and dark energy? So black hole information paradox is uh, this bizarre uh, face-off between quantum mechanics and uh, relativity. And relativity tells you that whatever that falls into the black hole uh, uh, cannot get out, uh, as long as it doesn't propagate faster than the speed of light, it cannot get out of the black hole. And yet quantum mechanics, or applying the laws of quantum mechanics to black holes, tells us that black holes should disappear. So everything that falls into a black hole should eventually get out. So this seems like a paradox. And uh, uh, more precisely, the question is what happens to the information, um, zeros and ones, or basically all, all the things that um, tell you the shape, the properties of the star that made the black hole. Uh, what happens to all that information? I mean, different uh, stars could make black hole of the same mass and spin, but then uh, when they evaporate, they all look the same. So the question is, uh, how can this happen in relativity? Is this consistent with relativity and quantum mechanics? Um, and uh, uh, it's something that you expect from quantum tunneling, that in quantum tunneling, things that are classically forbidden, but energetically allowed, they can happen uh, in principle, even if the classical equations don't allow it uh, to happen. Um, but exactly how this happened in relativity is not, it's not clear because we don't really have a theory of quantum gravity. Now, whether it's related to dark energy or not, uh, it's not clear, it's a matter of a speculation. So we had a proposal, uh, uh, in 2009 with my uh, former PhD student, Chanda Prescott Weinstein, that maybe dark energy could be a type of quantum hair for, uh, for black holes. So uh, when you form a stellar black holes, um, they uh, basically their, their horizon is not exactly consistent with uh, horizons of relativity, but there are quantum effects near the horizon that could source dark energy farther, far away basically. So that's a proposal, but that's just a matter of a speculation as things are done. Your recent work has focused a lot on the echoes of black holes. What are these echoes? So if you want to solve, say, the black hole information paradox, or try to understand what is the quantum nature of um, black holes, uh, you may imagine that there's some quantum structure uh, at or inside the horizon. In fact, you don't expect there to be exactly a horizon because any quantum object, uh, if you throw stuff at it, there is some probability that things can get out. So uh, laws of quantum mechanics don't allow for perfect absorption. So in quantum mechanics, uh, there's always a probability of uh, uh, reflection and a probability of absorption or scattering and absorption. Uh, so if you take that seriously, and then you imagine there's some quantum structure near the horizon that could solve the information paradox, 
then you may also imagine that if you throw stuff at the horizon, then part of it could partly be reflected. And, and then uh, this actually could, could generate an echo chamber between this quantum structure and near the horizon and the classical gravity of the black hole. So things can basically bounce back and forth and then lead to echoes. What is the theoretical motivation behind these echoes? What physics leads us to them? Uh, so the theoretical uh, motivation is um, uh, manifold, but it ultimately all comes down to uh, quantum nature of black holes. Uh, just the strongest motivation comes down to quantum nature of the black holes. Um, so if you want to solve the quantum information paradox, for example, or black hole quantum information paradox, you may want to have some quantum structure near the horizon that could radiate away information of the black hole. Uh, you may imagine that the entropy of the black hole, which is pro proportional to, this, to their area, that requires basic information of the black hole to be sitting at the horizon, and that could uh, reflect, uh, uh, reflect incoming waves. So these are all um, things you may expect from quantum nature of the black holes, and generically you expect to get echoes out of this. There's an interesting uh, analogy uh, with the discovery of Higgs. Um, so, uh, so Higgs, we have expected this for a long time, has been predicted, uh, and there, the reason it's been predicted basically more around 50 years ago, longer by, by multiple people, including Peter Higgs, was if you just take a standard model of particle physics uh, and take the symmetries of uh, uh, quantum, uh, quantum field theory uh, for a standard model, uh, and then you require that you respect um, laws of uh, basically the symmetries of the theory and the laws of quantum mechanics, and then you require um, there to be an additional particle uh, somewhere around energies that Higgs was discovered. Uh, we couldn't pre exactly predict where it should be, but there's something should have been there. Uh, otherwise, uh, basically you couldn't have unitary evolution. It's a unitary, unitary, unitarity of quantum mechanics which is one of the basically fundamental postulates of quantum evolution, that would have been violated uh, at that point. So uh, there is a similar story with black holes. Uh, if you want black holes, uh, which obey the laws of quantum gravity, uh, they, uh, they obey unitarity. Uh, and if you want them to satisfy symmetries of uh, gravity, but in this case, gravity symmetries are different from symmetries of uh, a standard model, but nevertheless, it has its own symmetries, that leads to say thermodynamic properties of black holes. If you want all of that to be uh, true, uh, then you require uh, this extra signal, which uh, basically with the structure near the horizon. Uh, so in some sense, you could say that uh, Higgs to, um, to standard model is like echoes um, to black holes in the sense that they both are signatures of um, non-violation of unitarity or uh, basically per perseverance or, pre uh, or uh, survival of information, basically. What other relations do these echoes have to the information paradox? And what does scrambling of information inside a black hole tell us about these echoes? So basically, the, 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 the echoes uh, give you the um, the tools or uh, or instead in the, the echoes are the smoking gun that uh, it, there doesn't have to be an information paradox because if there is quantum structure uh, at the horizon then um, then basically they could be radiated away they're not hidden behind the horizon they are just sitting outside uh, uh, where we can see them because if 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 all the quantum structure were inside the horizon there would be no no reflection. Uh, so the fact that, I mean, if we do see echoes, that means that there doesn't have to be a paradox because there is a structure out there that could radiate away the information. And in fact, you could even uh, more precisely connect it to Hawking radiation, because if you imagine there's a black hole that's sitting in vacuum um, and it's, I mean, it's Hawking radiation, then this radiation can be stimulated the same way that basically lasers can be stimulated. Uh, so the ra Hawking radiation can be uh, stimulated if you emit extra radiation uh, on, onto the uh, black hole. 
Uh, and the idea is that this stimulation of heart rate radiation, uh, if there is infall in radiation, that could lead to echoes. This has been very, this is a very interesting development, uh, basically uh, inspired by holography, where we, people have uh, compared the gravitational systems with quantum mechanical systems. Basically, there are mechanical systems that live on the boundary of gravitational systems, and they, um, they, obey, uh, they have the same dynamics if you use the right dictionary. And one thing that uh, a lot of researchers, including a string theorist, have noticed is that uh, there is a time scale for, um, for a scrambling of information in, uh, in uh, chaotic systems. Basically, if you introduce a perturbation, how long, uh, how long does it take for that perturbation to propagate throughout the system and uh, basically thermalizes? And that's known as a scrambling time in uh, quantum systems. And what, one thing that uh, my students, Christian Saraswat, showed recently was that if you look at uh, gravitational systems that are analog to these quantum chaotic systems, uh, the echo time in all of them is the same as the scrambling time, which is a time which is long, but not too long. It's only logarithmically long. It's basically long by the log of the entropy compared to the thermal time scale. Uh, and basically, the, 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 the heuristic understanding of this is uh, based, uh, if you throw something into a black hole, uh, by the time that all the information is spread throughout the black hole, that's when the uh, system realizes that black hole is not a classical bottomless pit, but rather it actually has a bottom, has, um, uh, it's, it doesn't go, it's not infinitely deep. Um, and at that point, you can get reflections. Uh, and that's the time I scale for scrambling where basically information is, information is completely uh, spread out. And then you realize that there's a finite place, basically you, you hit the bottom and then come out. Um, so that's the sense in which a scrambling uh, could be related to echoes and the, the numeric, there's this numerical coincidence that they are the same. What is the general time interval between such echoes? And how does it depend on the mass of a black hole? Good. So, so the time scale, it's, um, it's basically a thermal time scale or roughly period of a Hawking photon uh, times the lo log of the entropy, the logarithm of entropy, which is, uh, so this black hole, the, for big black holes, this could be a, a big number, uh, but entropy is a big number, but the log of entropy is not actually that big uh, because logs just makes everything a small. So for a stellar black hole, that log of entropy is like a factor of 100. So if you look at the actual time scale for a 100 solar mass black hole, it's about a second. For a one solar mass black hole, it's uh, one tenth of a second. Physicists have long been searching for a correct theory of quantum gravity. Then how do these echoes benefit us in that direction? That's a good question. And uh, the, the main situation, uh, the main problem with understanding theory of quantum gravity is it's so inaccessible to us. It's, uh, most obvious places where we think about quantum gravity becoming important are like very large densities, maybe near the Big Bang, uh, or that the very heart of the black holes, if they have, but which is surrounded by horizons in the standard theory of relativity. So it's really hard to access these situations and you cannot really make them in Earth because you require much, much bigger energy that, for example, CERN has. Uh, however, black holes uh, might actually be, um, good in uh, making it easier for us because they kind of act like a microscope. So things that are very, very close packed near the horizon of the black hole, by the time they get out, they would be a stretch to a scale that we can see. Frequencies of gravitational waves, for example, that we observe by LIGO are uh, basically tens to hundreds of Hertz. And that's, uh, that's kind of, that's the power of black hole that is, it could act as a microscope that it could take the tiniest scales and stretch it to a scale that you can actually and see. How do we experimentally investigate such echoes? What are we looking for in experiments? 
that's an excellent question and it's a tough one because we don't actually have a theory of quantum gravity uh, and even if we did like if we say take a string theory uh, doing calculations for realistic black holes is a very hard it's a very hard calculation so so the technology to do this realistically is, is, is not there, but the hope is that we actually, if, if we could observe this, we can learn about theory of quantum gravity. So what we actually do um, as, I mean, as a first step is to try to guess the waveforms, basically the type of uh, reflections you expect uh, as a function of frequency and time. So uh, we, ex we basically predict uh, signals uh, at certain frequencies, uh, which repeat at certain time intervals, uh, and then go and look for them, basically. But there is uncertainty about exactly how these look like. So there are basically, uh, so we may not find things because we don't exactly know uh, what to look for. And that's the main challenge, that because we don't exactly know, some people may find something, others may not. So that's, that's the inherent challenge for looking for echoes right now. What seems to be the future direction of your work? And what is this program of black hole seismology? So, uh, so seismology program is, um, uh, if, if you look at other uh, fields, like for example, seismology of Earth, is how we can learn about the inner layers of Earth. Whenever there's earthquakes, there are uh, seismic stations across the globe and uh, they could actually uh, listen for earthquakes and when they hear various waves based on uh, modeling uh, uh, basically you could you could use uh, or tune the model of the inner structure of earth to to match the time the various seismic stations receive the information about the earthquake or this uh, and how loud that information now, this is a very powerful method. We have used this for, uh, for the sun to probe the inner structure of the sun from the vibration of the sun. And we've used it even for lots of distance stars uh, to, uh, to probe the inner properties and uh, other stars, even though for these stars, we cannot even resolve them. But if you look at just variations of the light of the stars, you could see the inner structure. Now, the hope is that we could do this with gravitational waves uh, to probe the inner structure of quantum black holes. Uh, and if you have enough information, uh, and if there's uh, basically this quantum structure is uh, visible enough, basically, in gravitational waves, uh, it could uh, basically allow a similar seismology program. Thank you so much for this wonderful interview session. Lastly, what piece of advice would you like to give to our young audience? I guess it's, uh, speaking of experience, I can tell uh, what mistakes I've done, which uh, they shouldn't make. And I think it's good to be curious and critical. Uh, I mean, as, as the students, uh, it's hard to, un uh, it's hard to, uh, appreciate how important being critical and curious about the information that you're, you're given are, especially in this age of misinformation. So you want to be curious and critical, but not overly so, um, because that's also a big trap. So you have, you have to be, I think, uh, in order to survive and basically live a happy life, you want to be positive uh, and be open-minded, uh, but also take things with a grain of salt and be careful and critical. And, uh, uh, and that's the, those are personal virtues, but at the end also you want to be kind to each other. And uh, it's, not, it's not a personal journey, it's a, it's a collective journey for all of us. So it's not just that we, we, we need to make ourselves happy, but also we have to make the, the world a better place for, the, for others. So be kind to each other and there will be challenges, uh, but if you keep an open eye, open, open eye and open mind and try to push the boundaries, um, I think uh, things will be okay.